Hi everyone, um, my name is Tom Daly, I work for Electronet. I'm also the panel liaison for the C4 group in Seagray. Um, very happy to have Waikin to present today, so I'll just let you know a little bit about Waikin. Waikin at the moment is based in Electro Electronet's uh, network development group. There he's involved in power system dynamic analysis, renewable integration of utility scale wind and solar PV distributed generation, and strategic planning for South Australia's HV transmission network. This planning includes emerging topics such as probabilistic network analysis and distributed energy resources such as storage and embedded generation. In addition to his current role, Waikin has previously worked in a variety of roles spanning large-scale manufacturing, teaching and research on solar cells, uh, semiconductor fabrication and quality reliability engineering and technology spin-offs in Australia, Asia and North America since the 1990s. His current technical interests include renewable wind and solar generation, power system modelling and energy storage and electric vehicles. With that, I'll pass over to Wei Kin to start the presentation. Okay, yeah, thanks, thanks for the intro, Tom. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, yeah, thanks for uh, taking the time to... We'll have a, about a session of an hour. Now, what I'd like to do today is really um, to share a little bit about what's been um, going on in South Australia particularly in relation with uh, the rapid uptake of rooftop solar PV that we've been experiencing over the past decade. Uh, although, in general, there's also this much uh, broader theme of a renewable energy integration. So that there will be certainly references to wind energy, which, uh, which is uh, one of the main uh, certainly renewable sources in Australia at the moment. Now, this is actually a, a quite a, there are many, many aspects to, to this. So what I will try to do in this afternoon's talk is really to try to give you a more of a, a broad-based overview of what are some of the issues that are involved uh, in terms of relating to solar PV. And um, really it is, you know, to provide a, an introduction to this topic yeah. And um, now, to contrast this, I think um, probably some of you will have been familiar with many of the issues in the distribution network due to high penetration levels of rooftop PV. Um, but in jurisdictions, things like South Australia and also Southeast Queensland, there's the penetration rates of uh, embedded PV is so high that you're actually seeing issues at the system level and even on the transmission level. So you will see there's a slightly different flavor to today's presentation in this regard. Okay, so I'll proceed. Uh, and I think before I jump into the presentation, I think I'd like to position this as, this is really not a talk meant to bash PV. I think uh, we've seen that in renewables, it can be a bit of a polarized forum sometimes. Um, personally, myself, I think clean renewable energy is a great thing. And if you believe, you know, in what's happening in terms of uh, you know, uh, impact on environment and climate change. I think renewable energy is the 21st century answer to that. And so, just to, you know, put a bit of a positive start, then I just put up there just a list of what is the typical benefits. And it's not just about technical and environment benefits, but there are certainly economic benefits as well. Um, but I think what is missed sometimes is, while we have a lot of people passionate about renewables, but integrating renewables in our power system while maintaining system security and reliability is something that I think people do, do, do not see immediately or see directly. And this is really some of uh, the aspect of this talk I'd like to emphasize on. Okay? Now, very much, although we've probably seen and heard so much about the growth of renewables in Australia, it is still really early days. I mean, as of 2014, more than 85% of our annual energy still comes from fossil fuels. So renewables really have a long way to go. And already we are seeing technical challenges. So imagine if you go to 50% renewables, I think the challenges technically and also from a market point of view will be even greater. Now, just an overview. Now we are fortunate in Australia to enjoy some of the best solar resources in the world. 
So what I put up here is just a map to show where all the best spots for solar energy is. And you could see that as a continent, really we are fortunate in Australia. Practically, we are the whole, our whole island is a prime site for PV. And you will be familiar with some other prime sites like, for example, the southwest of the US, and also locations in um, South America, particularly in northern Chile, where there's quite a fair bit of uh, PV penetration as well. Okay, and so, and of course, uh, parts of the Mediterranean and South Africa. Now, it's really the quality of this resource which has driven the growth of PV over the years. And uh, in this slide, uh, you could see that this summarizes the cumulative installed PV capacity in gigawatts over the years. And the first thing that strikes you if you look at the shape of this growth is pretty much an exponential curve. And as of last year, we had 256 gigawatts of PV panels installed globally. And the projections are we will be hitting something like 320 gigawatts this year. So imagine that, you know, this exponential growth is really going to be where most of the action will be for the, you know, going to the rest of this decade and beyond. And um, really an exciting uh, trend from a um, renewables point of view. And of course, that's ultimately driven by the economics. I think uh, while us, you know, engineers and scientists, you know, love the technology, but the economics has to work. Now, this is a, a graph that is um, Really, it's a bit uh, of a version of the Moore's law that some of you may be uh, familiar with. And this was um, done by Richard Swanson from Stanford, which is really a graph that depicts the learning curve. So basically, as your cumulative module shipments grow by a factor of 10, the industry goes through a rapid learning. And this results in a very, very significant reduction in the cost. So where we are now, I mean, compared to in 1976, every watt of PV was about 100 bucks. But now, in 2016, it's less than 50 cents per watt. And looking forward, post 2020, we could easily be looking at PV prices in the order of about 30 cents per watt. So it's going to be a relentless cost reduction, which of course means that PV will be really the most competitive option for new generation capacity going forward because of the low cost. Now, this slide here just summarizes uh, the trend in terms of large-scale uh, PV in Australia. Now, admittedly, this sector has been lagging the rooftop or distributed PV, but I put it up here anyway so we could see that there has been a number of uh, exciting new uh, plants being um, commissioned over the past year, and the most recent uh, being, of course, uh, Broken Hill and also the Ningen Solar Farms, which are at the moment the largest uh, large-scale farms in Australia. But what we are really looking in this talk is distributed PV. Now, what I have up in this slide is a summary, firstly, a breakdown of megawatt installed by the state, and the largest state uh, by far in terms of absolute megawatt installed is Queensland. Uh, now, this statistic is a bit dated, so this is actually from August 2015. So right now, the numbers are probably about 8 to 9% higher than what you see here. So Queensland, as of middle of last year, had about 1.4 gigawatts of PV. Uh, South Australia, we had just over 600 megawatts. Now, what is quite interesting, if you now look at the growth of PV, but not in terms of absolute megawatts, but in terms of per capita, so per population. So if you do that, then because I think uh, SA, by virtue of its low population numbers, actually has the highest per capita, PV, so that's around 360 watts per person. So you can, if you can visualize that, every man, woman, and child in South Australia is associated with uh, one and a half PV panels. So that's quite amazing if you think about it, that everyone here in terms of, you know, uh, uh, per capita growth. And uh, how it compares globally, now in terms of per capita, uh, South Australia is behind Germany, and Germany, the, the per capita rate is about 450 watts per person. Okay, so that's the uh, penetration levels and talking about. Now, the one thing that uh, Australia is really leading the world 
is in terms of the distributed rollout of PV. And many jurisdictions in Australia lead the world in terms of the percentage penetration of rooftops with solar PV. So you see to the left of the graph there, you have South Australia, Queensland, with probably now close to 30% of rooftops having PV, and also not far behind Western Australia, and even Australia as a whole has about 50%, 15% penetration of rooftops with PV. Now, so this is really where Australia is emerging as a case study for the rest of the world. And how do you manage, how do you plan, how do you operate power systems where you have such an extensive penetration rate of embedded PV? So much more so than even jurisdictions like Germany. Because in Germany, quite a fair bit of their PV is in terms of uh, more like a, a few megawatts size solar farms, some of it which is uh, connected to the distribution network. So in terms of rooftop penetration, so, uh, Australia is really unique in this regard. Okay, now here is uh, just uh, examples of the three classes of, uh, of uh, PV installations. You have your typical residential type of system, and then you have the mid-sized systems of a few megawatts, and finally, of course, you have the very large solar farms. So in Australia, we have three types. Um, now, besides all the details I've put up there, the one thing I thought I want to point out is look at the very dramatic cost reductions they have seen in terms of the levelized cost of energy of these projects. Now, for example, this system in the Adelaide Showgrounds, when it was commissioned in 2009, the levelized cost was about $725 per megawatt hour. So, but then look at, by the time in 2014, a typical residential rooftop has fallen to $187 per megawatt hour, and even the recent one, the Ningen Solar Plant, comes in at about $183. So there has been very dramatic cost reductions in terms of the levelized cost of energy from PV in Australia over the past uh, decade. Okay. And the last trend uh, I thought I want to point out is in terms of the growth, I think going forward, uh, it is likely that the commercial rooftop PV is going to be leading the growth, and in particular, with all with the expiration of uh, premium feed-in tariffs, most of the economic incentive for rooftop PV is going to be driven by self-consumption. And generally, for commercial installations, that's where um, the self-consumption is optimal because you know they're open from nine to five, and so they can use up most of their own uh, PV generated without relying on feed-in tariffs. So that's where the action is likely going to be. Now a bit of a longer range is in terms of what are some of the projections for PV costs going forward. And um, generally the consensus is that prices are falling and quite likely to be going below $2 per watt over the next uh, five to 10 years. Um, now, I've actually picked this graph because this graph also has the cost projection figures for battery storage. And it is a widely held view that the next phase of PV growth is going to be driven by the growth of battery as well. And the reason is simple, because when you pair PV with battery, this gives the generator the ability to time shift their generation. And that's going to be a major lever in terms of fully exploiting the low cost and the economic benefits of going PV. So I think if you want to watch for PV growth, you should also be watching the trends in terms of the cost of battery storage, because I think both of them is going to go hand in hand in the next phase of the growth of each of them. Okay, so this graph here is showing that the trends of both of these technologies going forward in terms of cost. Now, just an example, some of the jurisdictions which are leading in terms of the renewable energy penetration, and typically some of these, they are often quoted in international literature, would be, for example, in Texas, where they have a lot of wind, then our national electricity market in general, then in Ireland, which again is characterized by wind, then in Hawaii, in Hawaii is principally solar PV penetration. Uh, now, what's unique about South Australia is that we have high penetrations of both PV and wind. 
So if you were to compare the columns for wind and also the columns for PV, you will see that in South Australia, we pretty much are up there for both types of renewable resource, which means that there's an opportunity in, local, in, in Australia and in South Australia in particular for us to look at and study how to integrate wind and PV at very high penetration levels. So I think there are quite some unique opportunities in Australia in terms of wind and solar energy, not just in terms of system planning, but I think also in teaching and research. Okay, now we're going to go into the specifics of uh, the South Australian system. So what I, I thought I'll just give a quick overview of our South Australian system. Now what you see here are where the regions where you have most of the wind are installed, which is the bubbles here in green. And I've also shown where the prime solar regions are. But largely at the moment, in terms of large scale, these regions are not yet developed. But it's quite likely that you will see a few hundred megawatts of PV come up over the next few years. But as it stands, right now, South Australia, we have about 1,500 megawatts of wind. And a rooftop PV, about 660. And our thermal generation fleet, it's about 2,800 megawatts at the moment. Now, this is for a system with a peak demand of about 3,300 megawatts, an average demand of about 1,500, and a de minimum demand of only 800. So this is a power system that's extremely peaky in its load profile. So it is indeed a challenge to rebuild, plan a system that you can handle 300, you know, 3,300 megawatts and yet operate down to 800. This is really quite um, a, a very high uh, ratio because typically you are looking at something like between around two, between a minimum and maximum. But in South Australia, we are seeing uh, a ratio of a minimum and peak demand of over four. So it's quite a um, challenge from a system planning point of view to plan for the South Australian system. Now here are some um, penetration metrics for uh, South Australia. For particularly for PV. So I've mentioned about the penetration rate. Now at the moment, South Australia, as of 2015, is about 35% renewable. Okay, this is by annual energy, of which 30% is contributed by wind and 5% is contributed by PV. And so South Australia has um, a target of uh, being 50% renewable by 2025. I think my view is that we'll probably hit that by 2020, okay, given that we're already at 35% right now. And uh, with the pipeline of uh, large-scale uh, wind and PV in the, in the works, um, I think 40% um, probably will be well, reach well before 2020. Now, in terms of uh, instantaneous penetration, um, on the 27th of October 2014, we estimate that um, we had about 1,000, close to 1,600 megawatts of uh, wind and PV combined. So that's about 77% of the installed capacity during that time. So that's uh, at the moment the, the highest recorded instantaneous penetration of renewables in the system so far. Okay, and uh, the minimum, as I have quoted, is uh, 809, and that's on uh, Boxing Day of 2014 at 3 p.m. Now, at that time, it's estimated that in South Australia, the PV was generating about 370 megawatts. Now, bear in mind this 800 net demand. Now, because the PV is embedded, that means that your actual load in South Australia is probably around 1,100 to 1,200 megawatts if you add these two numbers together. Okay, but net refers to the demand from the grid and that offsets the amount of embedded PV. Now, in terms of the maximum instantaneous penetration of PV, uh, we probably had that also on the same day, the same Boxing Day 2014, at 2 p.m. And that's where it's estimated that instantaneously we had 32% PV contribution to, that, to the real demand at the time, which was about 1,200. Okay, so that's uh, just uh, some numbers to show operationally some of the PV penetration recorded in South Australia to date. Now looking forward, this is uh, a bit of analysis that's uh, actually done internally in Electronet 
where we projected a range of scenarios for PV penetration ranging from the most pessimistic, which is this blue dotted line here, to the most optimistic, which is the red dotted line. And in fact, uh, what we've seen so far over the last couple of years is that it seems to be actually tracking along the blue dotted line. And I think the reason being is that with the withdrawal of most of the feed-in tariffs, that um, a lot of the incentive for residential rooftop PV installation has been removed. So there has been a moderation in PV growth in South Australia. So it looks like we are tracking like a, this original projection had 660 megawatts by July 2016, which is very close to where we are at at the moment. So it does appear this is the trajectory uh, that uh, South Australia Embedded PV is taking, but of course this is assuming there are no major changes in terms of policy, in terms of uh, market incentives going forward. Okay, so um, that's some of our projections for PV growth in South Australia. Now, AEMO's own projections that they issued last year in July is for the amount of installed PV in South Australia to be equal to the average South Australian system demand by, in fact, that should be yep, 2021, so about, just about five years' time. So that's where, in theory, that on an average demand day, that all the demand could potentially, to a large extent, be served by PV only. Now, it will be really interesting to see how do you operate a power system when you have pretty much only PV online. And then uh, where does the wind energy go, for example? By then, we'll probably have about 2 gigawatts of wind. So it's quite mind-boggling to think um, where does um, 2 gigawatts of wind energy going to go to. So there's going to be significant spilling of renewable energy if those scenarios just eventuate. Okay, so that's a little bit on the part about the trend, recent trends in uh, PV uptake uh, in the world, Australia and South Australia. Now what we'll do now is now we'll go into the technical bits and to look at what are the range of issues that pose both a challenge in terms of system operation, system planning, but also I think presents an opportunity. So these are emerging areas of, a, you know, not just for um, system planning, but also for, for research and indeed also for, uh, you know, uh, for teaching as well. So um, I think um, these are really statements of opportunity in response to a challenge. Now, solar PV itself actually is not the problem. I think this is something quite important I need to stress. I think PV itself is a fantastic resource. You know, it's a clean energy. There's no moving parts. It is largely static, you know, so there's no um, visual distraction. Now, the issue is not so much of PV penetration itself, but the effect is when PV capacity comes onto the market, it actually pushes out conventional thermal generation. And this is simply because PV has basically zero fuel cost, just like wind. So consequently, the running cost of renewable generation like wind and PV is zero. But in contrast, thermal generation, you have the cost of fuel like gas, like diesel, and, and it's not so much also that you have a running cost, but it is around the uncertainty, the volatility around the pricing of those fuels that often determine whether the thermal generation units are dispatched. Okay, so what happens is that when you have significant capacities of wind and PV coming onto the market, basically that drives the traditional thermal generators out of the market. Now the issue here is that those synchronous generation units, they are classically been able to provide a range of essential system support services that's actually necessary in order for the power system to operate in a secure and reliable manner. Now, if you look at this diagram on the left, this summarizes the range of services that are provided by traditional thermal or synchronous generation. And I've marked out in this bubble here the range of services which are responsible for various aspects of system security. So for example, thermal units, one of their important contribution is in frequency control. 
So they help to regulate the frequency of the network. So, and this is by virtue usually in terms of the fact that most synchronous units have a governor control system installed, which means that they are able to modulate the power output in response to changes in the system frequency. And so therefore, by employing a negative feedback, they actually help to stabilize the frequency of the system. Now, another aspect of um, that is that of inertia. Now, synchronous generation are basically rotating, heavy rotating machines. Now, these rotating machines, they have a physical mass to them. Now, by electromechanical coupling, this mass actually provides electrical inertia to the power system. And the importance of this inertia is that it helps to resist change. It's pretty much like the second law of a Newton, F equals to ma. So if you have a high mass, then you have relatively small changes in acceleration. And this is exactly what synchronous generations contribute, which is electrical inertia to the system. Now, the other aspect about rotating machines is that because these generators are basically low impedance copper windings. Now, consequently, because of the low impedance, they have very high short circuit current ratings and short circuit contrib uh, what you call contribution. So this helps to stabilize the system whenever you have fault events. Because during this fault, essentially what you have are momentary short circuit current requirements which synchronous generators can provide to support a network, to allow the network to be able to ride through those disturbance events. So collectively, all these functions help to stabilize the network during network disturbances. Now unfortunately, when we talk now about renewable generation, now most of renewables are electronic based. So consequently, they are often termed non-synchronous and because they are electronic based, they do not have the same network support capability that synchronous generation gen uh, traditionally provides. So what happens is that you have a hollowing out of the network security type of services that traditionally synchronous generators have provided. And so consequently, you are left now with a power system that is relatively vulnerable to disturbances that in the past you would, be, would have been able to survive, but now the ability to ride through that disturbance has been compromised because you do not have enough ancillary service capacity left on the market. Okay, so that is really the, the core of the problem. So perhaps, of course, the, one of the opportunity here is what sort of new control schemes that you can introduce in non-synchronous generation to provide the same services that was previously provided by synchronous generation. So we'll talk about that shortly. Now, another challenge that, that we are certainly seeing in South Australia now previously, the classical system planning challenge had been planning for peak demand. So the whole philosophy around system planning was to put enough capacity in the market so that you are able to serve that capacity during system peaks. And this is of course the route also to what you know, people have been deeming to be overinvestment in the NEM. It's like you, know, you build an eight lane highway, but most of the time you only use two lanes. But occasionally, you will get enough traffic to use all eight lanes. But largely, most of those lanes are underutilized. Now, that is, in South Australia, not the primary challenge or focus anymore. Uh, indeed, now, most of our focus is on planning for minimum demand, not peak demand. And now, this is best exemplified, for example, by the statistics on the 26th of December 2014. Now, what happened, if you look at the benchmark then, at that moment, the percentage of PV capacity against our system light load at the time is about 54%. Now, that means that 54% of the generation capacity during that minimum demand are basically distributed generation that you cannot control, that you cannot dispatch, and who does not provide network support services. So in other words, you have no levers or no mechanisms by which to control the network. And so that is really the problem here. So as your minimum demand drops, the proportion of that uncontrolled 
phantom generation sources increases. And this is really a big issue for the system operator when you have a system that you cannot control. So that's why now the focus is really how do you manage, what sort of planning processes, what sort of technical solutions that you can put in place to be able to mitigate the operational risk associated with a minimum demand scenario. And I think um, this will only increase for not just South Australia, but also for all the other states as well, as you see more and more PV and also more and more wind generation come onto your systems. Okay, now, so this slide here um, is a summary again of um, what was discussed from a couple of slides. So again, the issue is really at the core of it due to the displacement of conventional generation and therefore reducing power system reliability and security. And really, we are talking about reduction in dynamic system capability. Now, I've spoken about some of them, inertia, frequency regulation. Now, in terms of um, voltage regulation capability, again, synchronous generators provide a lot of that in the past, but that has been uh, falling over the years as well. Okay, and so consequently, your ability of the system to write through faults are uh, gradually being compromised. And, um, and also, in terms of reduction in system damping, um, I'll, I'll cover that shortly as well. So in the past, um, our thermal units, um, they have um, control systems called the power system stabilizers. And really, those are the analogy, they, they are like shock absorbers, which help to absorb all the little um, oscillations that are present in the system. And this function is largely not available in converter-based generation. Now, specific to PV, there are a range of challenges in, for operational planning and also in modeling analysis. Now, firstly, because that most of our PV fleet are embedded, they are not metered. So you do not know at any time how much they're generating and where the generation is, in fact. Now, so as a result here, you are not able to plan or operate the network in the face of this unknown load or demand reduction. Now, so therefore, really, the response that is required here is that we will need some way of not just measuring these, but also how do you represent these in terms of your, your planning models, your planning methodology. And really, the need here is therefore, we need to start looking at uh, model, models that incorporate distributed solar PV. And uh, you also, because of the nature of this, you have at the, in the NEM, for example, you have something like one and a half million PV inverter systems installed. You can't model one and a half million systems in any software because no software has the capability. So consequently, you will really need to adopt more probabilistic type approaches. So in other words, instead of representing discrete generation levels, you have to use distributions in order to be able to represent the nature of the distributed generation resource that we're dealing with here. Now, the other one is that this distributed PV inverters, we are not certain how they would respond when you have system events or disturbances in your network. And so again, you also need models to be able to represent that what we call the dynamic or the transient behavior of those inverters. So there will be need to model the control systems that are present in those PV inverters. Now, again, because there are millions of these things, you, can, you can't have very elaborate control models. You can't have millions of them. Again, you need control models that can run under a more of a probabilistic analysis kind of framework. Now, this is all completely cutting edge stuff, things that are really, in fact, the subject of research in university. So there are no solutions yet, but certainly the need is there. Now, the other aspect is in terms of voltage and power factor control. Now, it's been really well understood now, for example, the problem of over voltage in distribution feeders when you have lots of PV, and this is something that's now well reported and well understood. Now, the trend is that, especially in feeders and in substations where you have so much PV that 
you actually get issues now at not just the medium voltage, but even on the transmission level. It's a little bit like, you know, having having your ship sink and then the water is now not only at your ankles, but it's not at your waist. So we are now in South Australia at a point where we are starting to see the impact of distribution connected PV even on our transmission network. So an example, we are finding that it is quite important to now start to look at coordinated voltage control or reactive power control between the transmission and the distribution network. So for example, most there are a number of distribution transformers where they're actually running out of tap ranges. And in fact, they have turned off all their tap banks and they have nothing more they can do. And there have been requests, for example, what can we do at the transmission level to manage the over voltage? So I think really we are reaching a point of our PV penetration in, in certain sections of a network where you, you need really a full network coordinated reactive power control strategy. And this is again a new paradigm, something that the NEM has never really been designed for and has not anticipated. So, and, and the, this need for joint network operation, joint network planning will only grow in the coming years. Okay, the other one is the backfeeding of our connection points. I think this is something that uh, has been well described. So what used to be classically connection point loads are now actually generators. And this is again something very new, especially for the distribution network companies because they are used to managing loads and not generation. So how do you deal with this new um, characteristic that has arrived on your network? Um, and the other one, um, when we have lots of electronic generation, power quality may start to become a concern, and in particular the issue of harmonics, and especially the fifth to the ninth harmonics are usually ones that are creating issues when especially you have high penetrations of PV accompanied with relatively high impedance lines, particularly when you have sewer lines. So these are significant issues going forward. Now finally, the challenge is for planning analysis. At the moment, there's really a lack of any practical or standard methodology in representing and modeling distributed energy resources, especially embedded PV. And I think some of you, if you work at system planning, particularly at the transmission level, you will be very familiar with this term called negative load. So everything is a negative load. And PV, unfortunately, is lumped into this one single load figure. So without knowing explicitly what breakdown is by PV, what is the real load in there, then how do you actually analyze the network in part of the system planning? So there's no methodology at the moment, and this is something that in terms of the plant modeling, it's really um, an emerging topic in our NEM. And I think um, really as we speak, in fact, um, in AEMO, there is uh, some thinking on around how do you model PV, for example, in PSSE going forward. So these are some of the challenges uh, specific to PV integration. Now, now I'm going to present, um, now this is again a broad brush treatment of the topic. So what I'm going to share now are just some of the operational issues that we've been seeing in South Australia. And again, this may not necessarily be a direct consequence of instantaneous high PV penetration, but rather, again, having a lot of PV capacity coming onto the market has resulted in the withdrawal of thermal generation. Okay, so for example, here is a graph that shows the relationship between the voltage at one of our major uh, HV substations in our transmission backbone as a function of the instantaneous thermal generation dispatch during that moment. Okay? Now, so basically if you plot how much thermal generation is online versus the voltage at this substation, which is our 275 para substation, you will see then you get a cloud. But what's interesting is that if you just visualize this cloud, in fact, it looks like a triangle. Now, basically, how this is interpreted is when you have 
a high dispatch level of thermal generation. You generally have a very well-regulated voltage at a power substation. But as your thermal generation level falls, you'll find that now your regulation capability at para is compromised. So your voltage will start to span a broader and broader range. So for example, when you have only 500 megawatts of thermal generation online, you can see voltages anywhere between 1.03 to 1.055. So this is indicative of the loss of a regulation capability for transmission voltage. And again, by the way, some of these scenarios happen at night. So it is not because you have a lot of PV online at that time, but just simply because there's just so much PV in the day that even overnight thermal units are reluctant to dispatch. Because many of these are boiler-based, so you do not switch on and off boiler-based generation over short time frames. So typically, you either turn them off or you turn them on in days at a time. So if they decommit, they will decommit for days. Okay, so what you see therefore consequently is the loss of this voltage regulation capability even on your transmission network when you have very high PV and also wind penetration levels. Now, another challenge is in terms of under-frequency load shedding. Now, under-frequency load shedding for most jurisdictions, it's the, it's the first control scheme that you rely on when you have a system event resulting in a loss of generation. Now, when you lose generation, now, in the absence of a capability to quickly bring, bring generation back, your only choice is to trip load. And so, hence, you have this scheme called under-frequency load shedding. Now, the idea, of course, is simple. When you trip load, you restore the generation load equilibrium. And so therefore, that should keep your frequency stable. Now what this is a, shows here is a simulation of uh, under-frequency load shedding response in South Australia under two scenarios. Now firstly, the blue one, which actually extends from here and goes down, is the response as it, is, as it was originally designed for. So you have a gradual, gradual fall in the frequency. Now, by the way, this is fractional frequency. So at 0 0.02, it implies a drop of about 1 hertz. So therefore, at this point, it's about 49 hertz. Now, this is the normal response. Now, when you have a lot of PV sitting in your distribution network, what happens here is that as you have an under-frequency event, there's a possibility that you get those inverters tripping off individually because they have their under-frequency settings quite high up in frequency. Now, this is because many of the PV inverters that were installed early on in the PV penetration has been set at relatively high um, under-frequency thresholds because the philosophy then was at the first sign of disturbance, trip off the PV inverters. So some of them, for example, have under-frequency trip settings as high as 49.8. That is because the assumption was there's not too many of them around. So when you have under-frequency, trip off the PV and let the primary control systems dominate the system. But now the problem is that you have so much PV that now the PV response is actually dominating your under-frequency response. Now what happens is then, as this PV strip off, you lose generation. So you are actually creating an even worse imbalance. As, 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 as this imbalance gets worse, obviously your frequency is now going to cascade, it's going to run away, and the under-frequency event actually becomes worse. And in this case, instead of around 49 hertz, you actually end up at a much lower frequency. And in fact, if you carry on in this simulation, uh, in fact, eventually the system will go black because your system is just not able to address that imbalance between generation and load because you're continuously losing PV during the disturbance. Okay? Now, another aspect about it is the loss of system inertia. Now, here is just a comparison of responses when you have two different levels of inertia. 
Now again, inertia is the resistance of a system to frequency change. So when you have sufficient inertia in your system, now these are shown actually under, I mean for both over frequency and under frequency. Now these are the trajectories that you see in the light blue and the light green. So you have relatively tighter frequency deviations. But when you have no inertia contribution from renewable generation, you will result in greater frequency excursions. And this is because the inertia levels in the system are much lower. And so there's an issue here in terms of the loss of the inertia that traditionally were contributed by synchronous generation. And so consequently, you need to have some form of inertial response from the new renewable generation. And again, this is an area of, um, uh, of work at the moment. Now, there's a, one positive though in terms of uh, reducing a thermal commitment. Now, when you have reducing thermal dispatch, the aspect of small signal stability actually improves. And uh, this here is um, some results to show that as you have lesser thermal dispatch, you actually have improved system damping. And this is shown by, um, this is actually an, um, an eigenvalue map. And when these eigenvalues move to the left, this actually shows that your system damping coefficient is increasing, which means that the system is getting better damped. And uh, this is actually perhaps one of the sort of um, advantages or the positive trends as a result of a reducing thermal dispatch. So small signal stability is actually improving as you have a redu reducing a thermal, um, uh, thermal dispatch. Now, the other one is in terms of PV modeling challenges. Now, as I mentioned, you know, it is not no longer adequate for you to look at modeling in a deterministic, discrete way. Instead, what you now not need to really do, like for example, instead of modeling under frequency with discrete points, you really now need to look at them as distributions. So here's an example where over in Electronet, we have started modeling solar PV and each point corresponds to one connection point. So in this particular model, there's something like 200 connection points with three frequency distributions each. So this whole cloud here is roughly made up of 600 points. So in other words, you need to start to have models where you have this relatively large number of tripping points in order to be able to start simulating a kind of a probabilistic response of the system and not in the classical deterministic nature. And this shows you a little bit also about what we've done in the modeling. Now in the past, there was only a single load representation but just very quickly, in this example, we have now split our load into an actual load component, which is a true or native load, as well as the actual PV and the reactive compensation associated with the PV. So going forward, you will need to have this explicit representation of PV in order to be able to adequately model your system. And so a single composite net load model will not be sufficient for this purpose. Now, this slide here, and uh, I think we are probably coming to an end in just a few more slides. Now, this is a bit of opportunity in terms of going forward. As you lose thermal generation, you're going to have a greater requirement for ancillary services on your system. And this graph here summarizes a number of these technologies that will feature in the near future. Now, in, at the moment, Okay, I need to change those numbers. Now, we do have a spinning reserve and dynamic reactive plant that is uh, certainly um, something well known in system planning. But I think going forward, so for example, synchronous condensers is going to make a return to our network because there's a need to provide inertia, voltage regulation, and fault level as you have withdrawal of thermal generation. So one of the immediate and uh, well proven technologies for this are synchronous condensers. But going forward also, we anticipate that we will start to see battery and also flywheel storage going forward, and especially as the cost of battery storage falls. So I think um, there will be increasing uh, consideration for these uh, network support services going forward. And so instead of looking at traditional peak capacity augmentation, you'll be looking at some of these dynamic augmentation uh, services coming onto your uh, networks and systems. Now, largely, uh, and also lastly, one aspect I want to touch on this afternoon 
is the development in terms of, uh, of standards. Um, now, in the past, what has driven our PV uptake was the Australian standard 4777, and that standard dated back to 2005. Now, in a nutshell, that standard is really inadequate, and that's the reason, the reason is that that standard really had no requirements for voltage support, for reactive support. It wasn't clear in terms of what were the frequency write-through requirements, and there was no provision for frequency control and fault level. So in other words, that standard resulted in a rollout of a PV inverter fleet that largely played no part in terms of dynamic support for the network. But last year, the update, a very significant update to AAS4777 was released, which actually specifies requirements for many of these uh, dynamic support aspects. And so going forward, that would uh, ensure that new PV inverters coming onto the market should at least provide some level of support to the network. Now this particular example is an example of the kind of mixed bag that you got under the previous Australian standard. Now these are graphs of the, the real and reactive power responses. So the real power is in blue and the reactive power is in orange. And you could see these are from three different inverters and they are completely different. It's like, you know, they are incomparable in terms of responses. And this is indicative of the fact that when you had very, very loose standards governing uh, roll out the technology, then you're really going to get a very mixed bag of equipment out there. But uh, fortunately now we do have the updated 2015 standard. And the new 2015 standard, for example, had requirements in terms of power inertial capability. And um, here is just a bit of an example there, which shows that depending whether you're generating or if you're charging, in the case of a battery equipped system, there's a requirement for you to either increase output during under frequency or to reduce output during over frequency. So there is a form of a power inertial response now mandated for new inverters going forward. And also requirements in terms of voltage regulation from, from a real power and also a reactive power. Okay, so I'll just put this up as examples, um, but we won't have time to discuss this in detail, but it's out there and you can read the Australian standards if you're interested. Okay, and lastly here is a bit of a list uh, there are challenges and opportunities from the market and policy point of view, um, but the one I, that I want to really point out is that uh, really going forward, there are opportunities in terms of reform for the market and regulation, in terms of providing incentives, for example, in terms of incentives for ancillary services to be provided to the market, and also in terms of, for example, synchronous condensers as regulated network services. Okay, so making, uh, uh, I'll say, enabling mechanisms in terms of some of these new services to be more economically provided onto the market. So at the moment, there are not many incentives, for example, for the provision of FCAS services. And so consequently, we do find frequently periods where there's a shortfall of um, FCAS or the frequency regulation. So you need reform in the market and policy to ensure that these essential system security services come onto the market going forward. All right, and so, okay, and so pretty much uh, that's what I'd like to cover today. Uh, now, this is a really a summary of what we discussed, and um, that's uh, something that, uh, you know, we can uh, look forward. And uh, large, uh, lastly, if uh, for those of you who may be interested to read more, I provide uh, three suggested references here. The first two are a couple of reports that um, of some joint work that Electronet uh, undertook with AEMO uh, since 2014 in terms of renewable integration, you will find many of the aspects that was covered this afternoon described in these two reports. And uh, lastly, there's also that uh, updated standard, which should be 2015, okay, there's a typo there, for the AS4777. Okay, all right, that's all for, I would like to present this afternoon. Now, happy to take uh, questions for discussion. Right, yeah. Thank you very much, Waikin. Um, everyone, I'm just about to unmute everyone, so feel free to ask any questions for our presenter. Um, go ahead. Hi, this is Angela. Thanks very much for the presentation.
I just have a question around the previous slide where there was a table and energy storage has a few asterisks. What was the asterisk? Okay. Yeah, sorry, in July, there's a, a lot of echo. Hmm? Might be best if everyone yeah. mutes themselves unless they have a question to ask. Okay, yep, uh, yep. Angela, um, so you're saying the table? Yeah, in the table there's uh, energy, energy storage listed as the solution and um, with the yes and no, um, but there was also an asterisk next to it and I was just wondering what the asterisk meant. Okay, yep. Okay, in this table, let me see, bring this up full screen again, yep. Okay, the asterisk means that it's conditional. Uh, I didn't have time to go into the conditions. Okay, so for example, for battery storage, I put an asterisk against the frequency regulation because the jury is out at the moment in terms of how effectively a battery storage can provide frequency regulation. Um, now, you might be familiar with, uh, for example, terms like synthetic inertia. Now, people have talked about battery storage potentially being able to contribute synthetic inertia to the system. Now, the problem, I mean, or rather the challenge on, and the, here is that the, it is still not rigorously defined what this synthetic inertia means. Now, inertia in the context of synchronous generation is is a physical rotating mass. There's no way a battery can simulate that because there is no physical moving parts in a battery. Now, however, a battery can try to simulate the effect of a rotating machine inertia by injecting power. But the question, and it still remains to be determined, whether the power injection, say within 500 milliseconds, as example, does that, that rapid power injection achieve the same impact as having, say, four synchronous machines online? It's still unknown. Um, and ultimately, now, I didn't have time to go into this, but it's about managing rate of change of frequency or rock off. Some of you uh, may be working in this area. And at the moment, no one has really done any measurements or any test bit to show that there is a one-to-one -one or a clear relationship between power injection and the, and the reduction in rock off resulting in an apparent effective inertia. Okay, so that's one reason why I put the asterisk beside the battery storage. So it's still not clear whether it offers the same you know, frequency regulation service as a, a thermal unit does. Yep, thank you. That answers my question. All right, thank you. Oh, so if there's no more um, questions, we might just wrap up this webinar. Um, so, Waikin, thank you very much on behalf of MGN and everyone else attending. Thanks a lot. Um, and uh, I'll get Tom to follow up on the feedback form and uh, possibly a copy of your presentation as well, and as well as publishing this webinar.